I don't know what is in the air, but wow, you guys are flooding melrobbins.com and the DMs with questions about whether or not you're getting used. There is a big difference between being used by somebody and being in a situation where somebody is used to the situation. I've got five takeaways that I'm going to share with you. And the first one is this. Hey, it's your friend Mel, and welcome to an extremely useful episode of the Mel Robbins podcast. I don't know what is in the air, but wow, you guys are flooding melrobbins.com and the DMs with questions about whether or not you're getting used. And I'm noticing a theme that as you listen to more and more episodes of the Mel Robbins podcast, something is coming alive inside you. And you're realizing that there are changes that you want to make, that there is a version of you uh, that you want to bring forth, that there's a higher or truer or more empowered you. And as you start to make the changes, you start to notice, hmm, other people around me are not changing. And um, starting to feel like maybe I'm getting a little used. And so today, you are going to hear from two listeners who are struggling with this topic. Am I getting used? And more importantly, what do I do about it if I think I am? And I want to just say something about this in case you're new. Uh, welcome, by the way. I'm Mel Robbins. I'm a New York Times bestselling author and one of uh, the world's leading experts on habits and motivation and change. And I do believe that inside all of us, there is this higher calling. There is a truer version of you that is longing to come forth. And if you're starting to tap into that for yourself, you'll notice that you get impatient with people around you who are not. You start to notice people who are not growing the way that you are growing. And that's normal. And today we're going to unpack the topic of how do I know if I'm getting used and what do I do about it if I am? And we're going to start that process with a question from a listener named Crystal. Hey, Mel, it's Crystal, and I have a big question. How to know if you're being used? I have two adult siblings that have always lived with me. One has been unemployed for more than three years. Last week, my working sibling was placed on PIP. I've always been the big breadwinner, and they and my mom all lived in my home. My mom passed away four years ago. It's becoming increasingly difficult to motivate them and or get them to understand the weight of responsibility is on me. I'm beginning to think they don't care and are enjoying the stress-free lifestyle they've become accustomed to, or they don't understand because they've never had this type of responsibility. I'm growing tired of carrying all the obligation, accountability, and responsibility. When are they going to grow up and be equal contributors or move out? Thanks for any advice. This is really eating up bandwidth in my head. I will add we had a horrendous childhood and largely why we all stayed together. There is safety in numbers and we had to have a united front against a very abusive father and ex-husband. He abused us all well into adulthood. Thanks for any insight. Thanks for all you do. Crystal, thank you for that question and thank you for the detail that you provided in the end. I think that's really relevant to how you handle this and how you think about the situation that you're in, okay? So I've got five takeaways that I'm going to share with you. And the first one is this. There is a big difference between being used by somebody and being in a situation where somebody is used to the situation. Does that make sense? I'm going to unpack this a bit because I think it's really, really important. When you're being used, that's a situation where somebody is intentionally using you or taking advantage of a situation to their benefit. They know they're doing it. For example, um, if you're uh, in a job and you've basically phoned it in and you're only staying there because you want the money, but you're not actually doing what's expected of you, you are using your employer. 
when you sneak stuff from your roommate's side of the refrigerator. You're using them. When you intentionally do something, like um, invite yourself to somebody's house, even though you don't like them, but they have a great pool and it's a nice weekend, but you are not that great of a guest or you don't really, you know, you gossip about them. You're using them. That situation is very different than what I think you're in, Crystal, which is you're in a situation where the people around you are used to the situation. They've grown accustomed to it. They are comfortable in it. And what's happened is you're now not comfortable with the situation, but they're just used to it. And so I think it's important for you, Crystal, to anchor there. And as you are listening to me unpack all of these takeaways, I want you to apply this to your situation. Are you in a situation where you're being used because somebody's leading you on, but deep down they just want sex? And yet they're telling you that this is more, but they just want sex. That's a situation where you're being used. Or are you in a situation like Crystal where the situation's been like this for a while and everybody's kind of used to it, but you're just sick of it. So you now want to change it. And the details, Crystal, in your particular situation matter because you guys are used to living together. You guys are used to being under the same roof. You said that you've been doing this for a long time. Your mom used to live with you and that there's safety in numbers. And so I believe what's happened is that you are just tired of the situation the way that it is. And that means that you are going to be the one that changes it. Because if everybody else is used to it and they're comfortable in it, they have no motivation or no interest in changing it. Why would they? It's working for them. It's just not working for you. And that's okay. So the second takeaway, you ask the question, when are my siblings going to grow up? When are they going to realize I'm frustrated? When are they going to? Never. They are never going to grow up. Why? Because they're comfortable. They're used to this. They're used to you being in charge. You've always been in charge. You've always been the breadwinner. You said as much. And so they're not going to grow up. And that's okay, everybody. That's okay. That means that you are going to have to be the grown up and you're going to have to parent. And I'm going to get to that. I'm going to tell you exactly what to do when you're in a situation where you're trying to make the people around you level up and help you change the situation. I also want to say for your sake, Crystal, and for anybody else that, you know, it sounds like you guys are all so struggling with trauma and PTSD. And so I know that that's also why you haven't shaken things up. If all three of you experienced horrific abuse, which you just said that you did, then you also have the added issue of people maybe not having healed from that trauma and maybe not being as proactive or as motivated or as self-sufficient as they could be. There was another detail in what Crystal said. She said PPI. What does that mean, everybody? It means a performance improvement plan. What that basically means is you're fucking up at work and your bosses have sat you down and they have said your work is not satisfactory and we are going to put you on a PIP, a performance improvement plan, which is very embarrassing. It's very confronting. It, I'm not making excuses for the sibling. I'm just trying to explain the psychology here of why they're not growing up and why they've gotten very comfortable with very low self-motivating standards. And you're now in this framework at work where you're being measured. And if you don't measure up, your ass is fired. A performance uh, improvement plan can be a really good thing because it means that they are providing a pathway for you to be able to excel, which means they believe that you can. But oftentimes when people are set up with a PIP, they feel so ashamed and embarrassed that they just quietly quit they feel like the writing's on the wall. They feel unmotivated and self-conscious. 90% of people, when they get put on a performance improvement plan, leave the job. Whoa. It kind of makes sense because you feel like you've been called out and you're embarrassed. And so it's really important how you set up a performance 
improvement plan. Because if it's literally like you suck and you're going to get fired unless you do these things, who wants to stay at that job? But if you set it up using what is called the 19-word magic sentence, this is something that's been studied at like Yale and Stanford, when you say to somebody, I have high expectations of this team and I think you're capable of achieving them, which is why I'm going to put you on a performance improvement plan so that you know what's expected and I believe you can achieve this. This is the path forward for success for you. That is a way that makes you want to play the game. And so, Crystal, ironically, we're going to put your family, your siblings, on a performance improvement plan, and we're going to set it up the right way. Because since it's your family, you can talk about your feelings, and you can talk about your need to feel support, and you can talk about um, these simple things that they can do that would make a huge difference in this living arrangement and in their lives and in your lives. So it can be like a really positive thing that you're going to do. So takeaway so far, you're either being used because it's conscious and intentional, or you're just in a situation where people are used to what's going on and they're not motivated to change it like you are. When will other people grow up and realize this? Never. You got to be the adult in this situation if you want to change it because it's your life it's your happiness. By the way, it's also your house. And it's your responsibility to lead the change that you want to see. Always. Another takeaway that I want you to have is when you're around people that um, are not motivated to change their lives, you're probably dealing with what psychologists call learned helplessness. Now, learned helplessness was first coined in 1965 by a very famous psychologist after doing these really awful experiments with dogs. I'm not even going to explain the experiments, but basically what learned helplessness is, is it's when you receive a series of setbacks or you are experiencing a lot of pain and you basically give up. You decide that there's nothing that you can do. It is what it is. And you just survive and try to cope through the pain and the situation. And it's the difference between being a person who is pessimistic, that you feel like nothing's ever going to change, you're never going to be good enough, why even bother? Boss never likes my work, or I never do well at work, or my sister already takes care of things, and I'm never going to amount up to anything, versus having an optimistic point of view. And optimism, realistic optimism, is just the belief that through your own actions and through your own attitude, you can make a positive dent in any situation. That your effort is always worth it. That trying is always worth it. That growth is available to you. And so I say this because when you're surrounded by people that have this sense that nothing they do matters, it just creates complacency and fear. And there's one thing that makes a difference when you're in this situation. And Crystal, I think that's the situation that you're in. You guys have passed trauma. The situation has always been that you always take care of everything. Now you've got one of your siblings who's on a performance plan, so they're feeling kind of kicked down to the ground. And I would imagine there is this sense of pessimism there is this sense of I'm just used to life not being easy. And that's where you can come in. And this is the fourth takeaway. You ready? They need goals. They need goals set by you. Goals for how they are supposed to show up. You see, they don't know the path forward. They don't know how it's supposed to look. You do because you want the situation to be different. And so it's on you to set what are called SMART goals. For those of you who have not heard about SMART goals, we will link to the article that was written in 1981 where three researchers came up with the idea of SMART goals in the context of leadership and business. But SMART goals is a very simple and effective way to think about setting goals for yourself or other people. SMART stands for specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and timely. And so here's how this is going to work with your siblings. I want you to think about how the situation could be different. Put on an optimistic hat. And now we're going to paint a picture of what it would look like 
in the day-to-day living situation so that you feel supported. Because it's not just about the money. Are they doing anything around the house? Are they cooking? Are they caring for the yard? When it snows, do they shovel? Are they taking the trash out on Mondays? Are they making their beds in the morning? Like, what is it that would make you feel as though the dynamic has shifted, that everybody's leveled up in their own achievable way, and those actions make you feel a shift, okay? And so let's go back to SMART, specific. What are specific goals you could set? And those goals might look like you need to make your bed every morning. Those goals might look like uh, I'm going to make a uh, grocery list and every Tuesday, so-and-so is going to go to the grocery store. Uh, I'm going to create a schedule for who's cooking and who's doing dishes. And since you guys aren't contributing financially, that's what you're going to do. I know I'm being very kind of like annoyingly um, detailed here and maybe in a really um, condescending way. I don't mean to be. I'm trying to say that because people don't know what you want, which is what you should assume, and you're the one who wants the situation to be different, you have to get crystal clear, black and white, granular, meaning specific. I got to be able to measure it. It's got to be broken down so that your siblings can achieve it. It's got to be realistic, and it's got to be timely, meaning do it on a Tuesday, do it on a Wednesday, every weekend I expect this. Because that is how you lay a path forward for somebody who is in a hole to be successful. So the final piece, the fifth takeaway, is this. When you see your siblings doing those actions, when you see them checking the boxes, when you see them making their bed, when you see them spending an hour every day looking for a job, or you see them checking in with you for 10 minutes every night about how work went today. When you see those actions happening, you got to cheer for them. Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to create an environment where somebody knows that you believe in them. They know what your expectations are. They know the defined achievable steps that they can take in order to make you happy. And then when they do those things, you got to, you got to cheer for them. You got to say, thank you. You got to say, I appreciate you. And why this is so important is because you're not dealing with a situation, Crystal, where you're getting used. You're in a situation where you're trying to level up your siblings and you're trying to do it when there's issues like generational trauma and hopelessness and patterns in place and a dynamic between all of you, which means you got to get super intentional about what the new game looks like. You got to define it. And then like an awesome coach always does, you got to cheer for your players as they are in that game. That's how you do this. Um, And I know you can do it because I can just tell based on your voice, that you are somebody who is a very matter-of-fact, professional, successful, awesome person, which is why this is frustrating. Because we all think that everybody thinks like us. We all think that all those things that you think are obvious, why do you put your stuff on the floor? Why don't you just let the dog out? Why do you leave the dead flowers in the vase on the kit? Don't you just... We think it's obvious. It's not obvious to everybody. But you can make it obvious, and you can make it a game worth playing, And don't forget, you get to talk about your feelings. Guys, I love you, but I feel frustrated. And I'm starting to feel a little used. And I'm starting to feel very sad because I see you guys just coasting in life. And I believe that there's something more for you. And so here's my request. If you're going to continue to live with me, and I want you to, I need you to show up differently. And here is what I need from you. And I know you can achieve this. It would make a huge difference for me. And if you don't think you can do that, then maybe it's come to the point where we can't live together. But I need this support from you guys. And you might be surprised at how they show up if you frame it in the support that you need from them. It would probably feel really good to know that I could actually do something that my sister 
would appreciate and feel supported by instead of feeling like the one that's not successful. So that's another way to look at it. But gosh, I really appreciate your question. So thank you. All right. So that's question number one. But don't you dare go anywhere because coming up, I'm going to be coaching a listener of this podcast live. Her name is Brooke. And Brooke's boyfriend has not worked for two years. And she's feeling used. And she has no idea how to bring this up with him because she wants him to get a job. She wants things to change, but she's scared he's going to leave. We got all of that coming up next. Welcome back. Uh, I'm Mel Robbins. Today we're talking about what you do when you are feeling used and how you can inspire people around you to level up the game of life without trying to fix them. And I can't wait to jump in with this next listener. Her name is Brooke. She wrote to me because her boyfriend hasn't worked in two years. And honestly, she's tired of it. So let's get Brooke on the line. Brooke! Hi. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Of course. So tell me your, you're so cute. I love your glasses. Oh, thank you. I like yours too. And the photos behind you are so cool. Oh, thank you. That's actually of my best friend. She just passed away um, a, oh. uh, a little over a year ago. Oh, that sucks. I know it really does. Yeah. How can I help you? So um, I just would love your advice on this. I have a boyfriend whom I love a lot for many reasons, um, but he hasn't worked in almost two years. Um, he lives with me and isn't contributing financially, and it feels he doesn't see a problem with it. Uh, when I bring up getting a job, he gets defensive and often leads to not only a conversation that ends up not being productive, but he becomes more distant. He doesn't have a close relationship with his friends and family. I am his closest person in his life. Um, and I have learned that this is, makes it really difficult to persuade him or encourage him. I want to be supportive and allow him to have his own process of change, but it's frustrating because I'm paying for everything. And um, I also feel like I can't fully trust him and he's turning away from me. I'm not sure if he's using me or he's going to become what I feel he's capable of becoming, which is a greater version of himself and find a job and be better. Um, this relationship feels toxic, but also feels you know unique. But this is the greatest issue that I'm having right now. And I just don't know how to go about it. Gotcha. So that was great. And now I want you to just talk to me and tell me what's going on like a friend. Okay. So what's going on, Brooke? Well, actually right now I've been finding that, you know, besides the work situation, we have been getting, you know, our relationship has not felt as toxic. Um, we haven't been fighting. We've been getting along. Um, I just don't bring it up. I don't bring up the, him not working as much because it does lead to friction. I can immediately see his uncomfortability in it and he just kind of shuts down and gets defensive. So I kind of leave it alone, but I, I can't keep leaving it alone. Like I really feel it's inappropriate that this is what's going on. Yeah. How long have you, what's, how long, does he know you're talking to me? He does. He, I, I made him leave the house, so he couldn't hear what was going on. <laughs> and how did he feel about you talking to me? Good. Um, he was supportive. I didn't go into detail about what it was about. Um, he knows I listen to your podcast all the time, though, and I make him listen to it, too, or I'll like, sneak it on when like I'm driving in the car, because that's usually when I listen to you anyways. Um, I just, <sighs> me and my sister were just talking about this the other day, I feel like, with you know, listening to your podcast, I feel like I am realizing things that I need to change and I'm doing it, but no one else around me in everyday life is doing the same things. So I'm trying to be patient and like using different tools. And it, she was laughing. She's like, I feel the same way. Like it's, it's so hard to, you know, you want to just like show, like put you in everybody's face and like get them to understand it and feel the same way and change. But you know, that's not always what happens. Well, I want to get some facts. So how long have you been with your boyfriend? Just about three years. Okay. And for how long has he been unemployed? It's going on two years now. I um, It was January of last year that he officially stopped working completely. Um, and then when he, he was working and he kind of wasn't 
doing that great. Like he was going there late and his boss was getting frustrated with him. And then I think his boss actually ended up letting him go. Mm -hmm. And he just hasn't been motivated to do anything since. Um, He was incarcerated for eight years as well. And I don't know what that's like. And he does say a lot of times that he believes that that could have something to do with where he's at in his life. And he gets very frustrated with that. I'm sure. I don't know how to help him in that way at all. I I don't, I want to be supportive, but I also need support too. Yes. Yes, you do. You deserve support. And I'm glad you reached out for help. And there's a couple things that I want to say right off the bat, because I'm going to ask a few more details. Okay. It's important for you to know that in the beginning of my career, I worked for legal aid and I was a criminal defense attorney. And so I represented in the early parts of my career, people like your boyfriend, who were either accused of or convicted of crimes. And I believe that once somebody has served their sentence, we need to do a much better job as a society in rehabilitating, in empowering, and in welcoming people back into society. And so I'm glad that you shared with me that he did spend eight years incarcerated because there is no question that the re-entry into life outside of the jail system is very jarring, traumatic, isolating. And one of the things that I know a lot of people that I represented really struggled with is not only the rejection and the scrutiny that you face when you get out, and in some states, the laws that make it very, very difficult for you to truly find meaningful work, is that the structure of being incarcerated is completely removed. And even though it is horrendous to experience any time behind bars, there is this kind of certainty that you come to rely on in terms of the day-to-day schedule. And so for somebody like your boyfriend to get fired and lose that day-to-day structure, it does not surprise me at all that he has spiraled mentally, that he has not um, got any motivation, and that this has been a very challenging situation for you to watch as well. And so I'm saying that because I want you to know that I'm bringing a level of not firsthand experience, but having either represented or counseled or kind of coached people that are in this exact situation, this is more complex than, say, Christopher Robbins, my husband, losing his job because of the added shame that you feel, the added discrimination that he's probably experiencing when he goes in to try to find a job. And um, was he in jail for um, a felony? Or well, it must have been a felony because it was eight years. Was it a violent crime or was it more of that sort of white collar, as they say, crime of financial fraud, that kind of stuff? Well, it was it was a pretty um, it, I guess you could say violent. It's it was armed robbery. It was a young kid. Yeah. And he, you know, it was with a cat. He fucked up. Yeah. And he ate right. And it, and it was a shame because he was so young when he went. You know, I do understand that he is not that person anymore and yeah. has lost a lot of time. What he often tells me <clears throat> and before I started you know, working on myself, I used to get very defensive and kind of just, you know, stab him with my words. And because he really feels like he is owed something. Mm. He feels that he doesn't even know what he wants to do, who he is. Like he just got into skateboarding, you know? And at first I was like, you're not a child. You know what I mean? You need to work. This is real life is people have responsibilities. And, you know, my dad would get involved too. And really kind of, I felt like I was bullying him in a sense, now that I have some different perspective and I do want to be supportive and I don't want to be bullying him. And I don't want to discourage him more than he already is. I feel that he is, he has so much potential. He's so smart. Um, He's fluent in sign language because his mother is deaf. Um, He is like, can figure out how to do anything. You know, he's very capable and 
He presents himself very well. He's just not applying himself. He's just not going out there. And I don't see it changing anytime soon. And it's starting to freak me out. Um, it should freak you out because two years is a very long time. Mm-hmm. Two years is plenty of time to let somebody coast. And I agree with you. It is time for the dynamic to change. And what you're really asking, and this is what's universal in your question, and one of the reasons why I really wanted to talk to you, is that we all have the experience in life of seeing the potential in somebody that we care deeply about and doing whatever we can to support, to push, to cajole, to like whatever we can to try to get that person that we care about to see their potential too. And the truth is, That at some point, if the person stays stuck and you start to feel as you said you do, am I getting used? Like, what is going on here? Something's got to change. You have to change the way you're showing up. And the reason why I say this is because... While he's going to have to do the work to tap into his own potential, we've got to disrupt the dynamic between the two of you in a healthy way so that your kindness and your generosity and your patience is not enabling him to stay stuck where he is. And I believe in this deeply for a number of reasons. Number one, um, I do think... When somebody's really struggling, they need your compassion. They need your support. They need all of that. But if you start to share how it makes you feel to watch them struggle and you start to offer up things that they could do and he is actively not doing those things, then what's happening is you're now, after two years, standing by watching somebody slowly self-destruct. And, and so this is a really common thing that we all face. I can think of somebody that I care deeply about who's really frustrated with her husband who drinks too much and needs to lose 50 pounds. And they had a really big scare where he threw his back out and he couldn't get out of bed and he was so big, she had to get three other guys over to get him to go from being horizontal to standing up and it scared the shit out of her. And... When you get to the point where you are, where you're sort of like at the end of your rope, you care about this person, you feel guilty about being tough with them, they get defensive when you are, you have to change your strategy. And I relate to this, Brooke, deeply because I remember when um, Chris left the restaurant business, uh, he was a shell of himself, complete problem with alcohol, um, and just devastated because he had not provided he felt he had failed in his career and i looked at him and i was like number one you got to get sober and number two you got to talk to a therapist those are non-negotiable yeah and, therapist too. that's i'm sorry i don't want to cut you off at all but i really feel like he needs to see a therapist for several different reasons clearly and i don't see him being too receptive of that too there was a time where he talked a little bit about it but i just He's he's very close minded right now, and I'm sorry, okay. and I didn't mean to turn that into a I'd go no. in a different direction with what you were saying, but I did want to throw that in there. That's very important too. It is very important, and this is where your strategy can change. You ready? Yeah, I'm ready. You've paid all the bills for how long? Um, for two years, I guess technically. I mean, even when he was working, girl, wasn't okay. Contributing too much, but. You've been paying the bill for two years. How does it make you feel to have all that responsibility on your shoulders? Well, in one way, it makes me feel good because I am getting it accomplished, but I feel like he's taking like taking advantage of. Okay. Um, one of the things that I want you to change is you need to have a conversation with him and you need to say, I can't do the work for you, but it is breaking my heart to watch you struggle and to, in my opinion, not see you taking the proactive steps 
to change this. And so I have new boundaries that I need to express for myself. And that is, if this relationship's going to work, you must go to therapy once a week for three months. Because I believe that the reason why you're not flourishing is because you have PTSD from being incarcerated or you are struggling with depression. And if I don't see you take the proactive steps of going to counseling for the next three months, once a week, then this is not going to work and you're going to have to move out. I will pay for it, but you have to be willing to meet me halfway because I can't stand by and watch somebody I love self-destructing. And I've given you two years to try to figure it out on your own. And what your behavior has communicated to me is that you're not capable of doing this on your own. And that's okay. You need a ladder to help you climb out of this hole. So I'm going to tell you what that ladder is. I personally agree with you. I think it is therapy. But I don't want to shove that down your throat, Brooke. So what is one behavior change that you could say to him? I can't make you do it. I am not going to force you to do it. I'm not going to guilt you into doing it. I'm just going to express a very clear boundary. We are not going to be together if you don't do this thing. I don't really know. I guess I would like to see him, you know, seeking out at least one thing that will be the start of helping. And I'm not sure what that first step would be, whether it is to seek some, you know, I think you do help. know. I think you do know. <laughs> Tell me, what is it? See, because here's the thing. We all make the mistake of being like, I want you to start working toward it. That's not specific. You actually have to create a structured thing that he needs to check the box on because while he won't do it for himself, the relationship is important to him. So he will do it for you because you have expressed this boundary. I don't know if that's true or not, but. What do you mean you don't know if it's true or not? That's where the toxic part comes in because I honestly like, um, I just feel like when we have conversations, like, cause I have kind of approached this similarly to him before. And he'll say like, well, this is what, this, we had broken up uh, for a short time recently. Um, Did he leave and pack up and leave the house? Well, it took him a while to pack up until I forced him out, but, and then I regretted it. And, you know. Why did you regret it? Because I, of my own toxic traits, I, you know, I want him back. I don't want to be alone. And I, you know, started getting scared because, you know, he was talking to somebody else and it just, you know, really freaked me out. And I do feel like I love him. I just, I don't know. And then he throws in my face because like, you know, he came back and sometimes he'll be like, well, this is, you know, I don't know. I need to figure myself out. I told you I need to work myself, but he's not working on himself. That's not what that means. When And when we broke up, he wasn't working on himself. He was trying to get into another relationship with somebody who's 10 years younger than him. And, you know, he was not ever going, you know, his dad lives just shortly down the road. And that's where he was supposed to be like residing. And he wasn't, he was like out all the time, wasn't sleeping early. You know, he was just, he was really a mess. And then showing up here unannounced and give, you know, breaking my heart over again and, and being callous and mean. And we've, Brooke, I, feel like we've, I know this is bad. This is no, bad Brooke, <laughs> he's not breaking your heart. You're breaking your heart. Why does that make you emotional? I know that's true. I feel like I've abandoned myself. And, you know, I, I've listened to one of your podcasts about the attachment theories. I'm definitely um, the anxiety version of those. That, you know, he's the avoidant. And, you know, I say sorry a million times. And I just like want, you know, I just feel like I, you know, need him to love me. And I've been just not being very nice to myself, you know, in the process of that. 
when it becomes more important for somebody else to love you than it is for you to love yourself, you're in a really toxic dynamic. And I want to commend you on something. I think deep down, you know this. And what actually scares you is you're starting to tap back into your self-worth and realize that you're better than this dynamic and you deserve better than this dynamic. And it scares you because you've never been in a relationship with yourself or with somebody else where there's been a healthy dynamic. And I would imagine, I'm willing to guess, that you are attracted to men who are not available because this is what was present in your childhood. Is that true? I'm not sure exactly. I, I have looked into that, and I, I'm sure that it is. Well, which one of your parents do you uh, chase more in terms of wanting affection, approval? My mother. And did she feel like she wasn't that available? Yeah. Yeah, she did. Like, she was there, and but she, you know, is kind of like me as a mom right now, which I feel guilty about. But, you know, she kind of cared more about her shows, and she, you know, went you know, my parents got a divorce. She really wasn't pre like emotionally present and she was always tougher with her words. My dad actually had left the relationship, but he, you know, gives me the world now, you know, and I just am still trying to like get that relationship back with my mom. And I hate to say that because she'll probably watch this and she's been really trying to, you know, express to me lately, like that she's sorry that that's happening again now because she's going through her own personal struggles. And right now, personally, I'm not affected by that. I do understand yeah. that. I'm an adult well, now and I see things differently and I love her dearly and she's I doing think, a marvelous job. How is the dynamic with your boyfriend similar to what it was like when your mom wasn't available? I mean, I guess I can only really talk about how I feel with how it is currently because I don't know, but... I just, with, with my boyfriend, I feel like I'm constantly just trying to be so great. And then he, he's going to turn around and be like, oh, wow, you're so great. And like, I love you. You know, like, you're so great. I see what you did and I see how great you are to me. And I see you in general and I love you, you know, and I just feel like I'm constantly just trying to do that. You know, you are, that's why it's not enough. You're in a relationship where you're chasing somebody who is not available and who resents you for what you need and who is in so much pain and in such a hole that he can't possibly give you what you need right now. And you just keep telling yourself, so many of us fall into this trap. Okay, well, if I just try harder, I just do this, or I just do the other thing, then it's going to be okay, and then he's going to be happy, and then he's going to love me, and then it's going to be good, and then he's not going to want that woman who's 10 years younger, and you probably know that he slept with her anyway while you guys were broken up, and it's technically a broken up, so it didn't really matter. And even though it breaks your heart, you don't really talk about it. Is this the life that you want? No, it's not. And life and is too short. It's just too short, and I want to, you know, it's just, it's too short. I see the photos of your best friend on the wall behind you. What was her name? Molly. And what did she die of? An overdose. What would Molly tell you right now? She, she always told me to, like, to get out of this relationship and that I was, you know, I deserved so much better. It's just so confusing, and I just don't know if I'm it's not confusing. It. It's not confusing at all. You either deserve better or you think you don't. Brooke, which is it? I deserve better. And if you are acting, let's just, I want you to close your eyes, okay? Close your eyes. And together, we're going to travel forward in your mind two years. 
So two years from now, it's a beautiful spring day. This relationship is behind you or not. You get to choose. It is the future you. And you have spent two years, Brooke, really healing yourself, putting yourself first, and taking actions every single day that show you that you believe you deserve the best, that you love yourself, and that your heart is worth protecting, that you come first. Tell me what your life looks like. You're waking up. What does life look like for the future, Brooke, two years from now? I have no idea, Mel. Oh, my gosh, I don't even know. I can't even picture that. Yes, you do. Come on, let's picture it together. Imagine that I'm there with you. I feel like I would feel a lot lighter, first of all. Yep. I would wake up a lot earlier and not feel like I have something to look forward to. Um, yep. I would probably a lot be a lot more successful in my career. And I don't know. Yes, you do. I would just be happy and proud of myself, I feel. What do you see yourself doing that you're not doing now that makes you proud? I would be more present with my son. Hmm. And I would probably be more present with my friends that I have now that I, you know, don't really engage in as much. Um, sometimes I don't know. I, I would show up more for myself. What does that look like? Give me an example of how you're not showing up for yourself right now. I wouldn't have days where I like, just like feel lazy and lay in bed all day and binge watch television shows to escape my life. I don't know. I feel that's one thing I would definitely be doing, not doing. I don't know. I, yes, you do. Stop saying you don't know. I you just like... painted a very clear picture. Can I tell you what you just reflected back? Yes. You'd get up earlier. You would be more present with your son. You would not lay in bed all day and waste the day binge watching TV. You would be more successful. You would be proud of yourself. And you would probably wake up and have a day full of things that you were doing, whether it was volunteering or going to do something with your son or spending time with those friends that you don't spend time with right now because you spend all your time trying to fix this guy that doesn't want to be fixed. Fixing him will not fix you. You are perfect and lovable exactly how you are. And you deserve to have somebody in your life that sees that and that wants to grow with you. And I can't do this for you. I can tell you that if you break up with him, he will find somebody else. Because he needs it. And only you can decide, Brooke, whether or not you deserve to put yourself first. And I guarantee you, Molly is sitting there going, girl, break up with him. And what you don't know, because you've never experienced this, is will I be able to put myself first? Will I be okay if I'm alone? And here's my answer to that. You're alone right now. Just because you have a man living in your house who you're paying for doesn't mean you're in a relationship. You are lonely, you do not see your friends, you have isolated yourself, and you have put all of your worth into this guy somehow transforming and giving you something he doesn't have to give right now. And I can tell you that with certainty because his actions demonstrate that. I agree. I agree That's 100%. So 
What do you see as the next right step? I would probably want to approach it again with him just to see. I I, I just, I get so confused because like he is, he does do some kind, loving things. So I want to approach this again with him maybe. What does that mean? I think I want to, you know, tell him like these, I want to set that boundary and make it real. Let's role play. I'm going to be him. What's his name? Adam. Okay. Uh, that's All right. You ready? Yes. All right. So how did that thing go with Mel? Did she tell you to break up with me? Yep, she did. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I knew it. I knew that bitch was going to do that. <laughs> um. I don't know. I don't know how to do this, Mel. I'm so sorry. You, you're probably not going to want to air this. This is terrible. This is not about whether it's good or bad. You and I are practicing. Okay. I just, I just, I feel so incapable feel of what? everything. Ugh. Well, do you know how you change that? You try. You have to stop letting the feeling dictate what you do. You have to visualize a happier, more confident Brooke and let her guide you right now. And it's okay to write it down and read it to him. That's probably what I would have to do. Well, let's rehearse this. I'm, I'm Adam. Let's go. What is the boundary? I love you first and foremost. Um, I just feel that I can't sit here anymore and watch you not be your greatest self. I, I know that you are capable and have done some very amazing things. And I feel you're not showing up right now as that version of yourself for yourself and or for me. And I want to be in this relationship I it means very much to me but I am struggling with you not being a part of this with me together I feel we are on a team right now because of whatever it is that you are going through that's allowing for you to be this see I see a lot of words I see a lot of words is this going okay I think you're doing fantastic. Stop. Okay. Just keep talking from your heart. What is it? Tell, tell me. Well, I, I get that. So but what do I need to do? What do you mean? What's happening? I would really like for you to find a job and start. I've been looking for a job. Where have you been looking for a job at? I, I'm applying online. Oh, okay. Well, have you had anybody... No. Reach out to you? Okay. No. no. What can you do about that then? Like, what is it that you can do to put yourself in a position where that's, I don't know what to say. I feel like it's something like that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'll tell you why it kind of went off the rails. Okay. Because looking for a job is not something specific. Okay. And he's been doing it for two years and it has not worked. Right. Or he does because, DoorDash, but he doesn't DoorDash. You, you know, you can pick and choose your schedule in that job. I think, why would you not tell him that he needs to go to therapy for three months once a week? Because that's what you actually want. And that's what you think would make a difference. That's what, yeah, I was going to say that first. I really was. And I just, I'm scared to say that because I feel like it's not well, my this right. practice. Bullshit. Like, Bullshit. Like it is your, hold on a second, Brooke. You're paying the fucking bills. He is living with you. You have let this slide for two fucking years. And I'm going to tell you something else. Maybe he needs you to be stronger than he is. Maybe he needs you to say, I see something better for you. And I'm not going to fucking sit here and watch you flush your life down the toilet. And you clearly have bigger issues than I can help you with. So you either get your fucking ass in therapy and I will pay for it. And you're going to go every week for three fucking months because you're worth it. 
and you need somebody to help you sort out that bullshit in your head that you're telling yourself that's keeping you down and keeping you isolated from me and keeping you acting like this. There is a better man inside. And by God, I'm not going to let my fucking son be influenced by somebody who will not pick himself up and do the work. If you can make it through jail for eight fucking years, you can go to a therapist's office (laughs) once a goddamn week while I pay for it. And you want to know something else? I don't trust you. So I am going to drive you there. And if you're unwilling to do that, you don't deserve to be here with my son. And I am not going to stand here and watch you continue to spiral. I care so much about you that I am willing to say goodbye to you. But what I am not willing to do is sit here and watch you self-destruct. How's that feel? Really great. I want to be you. That was wonderful. Well, you have to get angry about like if like you perked up when I said your son. So what was it about the example that he is giving to your son that actually lit a fire under your ass, Brooke? He doesn't, he doesn't, he's being influenced. That's, that's the male role. And, you know, he doesn't have a biological father, you know, he is being around us all the time. He lives with me and he is my world. His name's Oakley too, by the way. I wanted- oh, how old is Oakley? Eight. This is pivotal years right now. I know. Oakley it is watching. Shit. Well, then fucking do something about it. I have to. I really have to. I don't know why I've I'll allowed myself why. to do this. Like, be I'll this tell person. you why. I'll tell you why, honey. And this is where self-compassion comes in. None of what you're doing is a choice. You are stuck in old patterns based on your childhood. You're scared to death of people leaving you. And your feelings and your fears are making you so hesitant And the other reason why this is not a choice is you deeply believe you're not worthy of love. And so you don't know how to act as though you deserve it. And so if you want to, quote, be me, use me as an avatar. And when you start to get those feelings coming up in your body, like, I can't do this, just be like, what the fuck would Mel say? Because here's, I'm not right or wrong, and this is your life, Brooke, so you got to decide what's right for you, but I will tell you, if you stay in that feeling emotional space of, I can't do this, I don't know what to say, you're just going to continue to have the same thing. But if you want something different, you got to show up and act in a different way. And since you don't know how to do this for yourself, that's okay. That's okay. Your why becomes bigger than you. It's about your son. It's about being that fucking mama bear. And it's about saying both, I love my son so much, and I love you, by the way, that I'm, I'm breaking the fucking chain in this dynamic right now. And since you can't do it, I'm going to tell you what's required. Does your son deserve a man in his life that will go to therapy for three fucking months to get help? Absolutely. Yes. Well, I mean, yes. not yes. that the person who ha- really probably deserves someone who doesn't have to go to therapy. No, no, no. I, personally, I think we should all be in therapy. There Me is too. nothing, but if you can afford it, it's the best fucking thing on the planet. You got somebody that is completely objective listening to you go on and on, and then they give you strategies. In fact, if we all talked to a therapist every week, we wouldn't have the problems we have because we'd be sorting through them and working on it and taking steps proactively to make ourselves happier or more fulfilled. Everybody deserves this. I wish it were universal that we all had access to this. So it's not that he needs it. It's also that he'll benefit from it. And your son will benefit from the example and you will benefit for sticking up for yourself. You have to remove the love piece from this. I'm serious. You're getting so caught up in the emotion of does somebody love me? Am I worthy? Bullshit. If this were your son, would you want him to go to therapy? Of course. I have put him in therapy too. 
So you get to say, Brooke, because you pay the bills, you get to say what happens next. I love you. I'm not going to stand for this. I love my son too much to continue for this dynamic, this broken dynamic. And you must see a therapist once a fucking week because it's the only thing I can measure. And if you're not willing to do that, this is never going to work. And you might as well move out. You've asked him for two fucking years to get a job. Do not ask him that. That's not working. What are your takeaways from this? Well, first, I feel like you've, you've painted a picture that I do feel in my soul very clearly for me to digest. And I do feel very much more confident in going in the direction of, I really like that we are going in the direction of the therapy as the ultimatum, because I believe that's the most appropriate approach. I'm going to do that. I feel confident in doing that. I feel confident in that for many reasons. Can I say something that I think will make you feel better? Instead of the word ultimatum, you're giving him a choice. He makes the choice. You're telling him he has two choices. Choice one is accept the gift and the request that you get support once a week for the next three months, which I will pay for. And you could even add, and we debrief and you share with me what you're unpacking so I can be a part of it and support you in it. And that's choice one. And choice two is, this doesn't work. Because it hasn't for a long time. And so you have, you are empowering him to choose. That's what a boundary is. It's, it's your line. You know, I remember when Chris was really struggling and I finally said to him, the doctor has recommended that you take medication for depression. And even though, you know, Chris leads men's retreats and He's a hospice volunteer and is in all this counseling and psychology and coaching and never, ever had any issue with me taking medication. The second he was, like, told he probably should do it, all of a sudden he thinks it means he's weak. And I did give him a choice. I'm like, this is not going to work if you don't try that medication for a year. And he got to make the choice. Same situation. I'm not going to sit here and watch you self-destruct. And we have tried everything else. And it's clear that you need a ladder out of the hole that you're in. Was he able to make his choice right away? Um, Or did he have to ponder about it? Yeah, it's it's (laughs) a week. It's a week. And you can give him a deadline, but you're going to have to hold him to it. How do you feel in the framing of it as you are presenting option A or option B? I think that's that I feel good about that. I feel like it'll tell me my answer. Yeah. Like if you ever want to know what somebody's actually committed to, close your ears and don't listen to a damn thing they say. Yep. Watch what they do. That, that part scares me a little bit, but I feel like. It's time to put my big girl pants on and deal with whatever he chooses because he does have the right and I'm giving him, you know, the option to choose and what he chooses is going to tell me what I, you know, can invest in for any much more time, you know, because my time's valuable. That's right, Brooke. And here's, here's the avatar for you. You ready? You're having this conversation, not as Brooke, but as Oakley's mother. And it's time you put Oakley first. He deserves more. He needs his mother. And this is a win for him either way. Because he either sees his mother 
stand up and have the strength to support a man in getting into therapy and healing and holding him to it, or he sees a mom who cares so much about him that she does not tolerate bullshit like this. And so if you go in as Mama Bear Brooke and you're doing this for Oakley, because these are the pivotal years right now, 8 to 14, right now, right now is what Oakley is going to learn about relationships and about self-respect and about boundaries and about what's okay and what's not okay. And it's a win-win either way because he either sees you change a relationship and stick up for yourself and it feels the love and the safety from you or he sees the same thing. Right. I love you. I love you too, Mel. I believe in you. Thank you. And I want to also come back to this point that sometimes in life, the people that we think we're helping actually need the push. Because just like you're trapped in your own past patterns of feeling and emotion, he is too. That doesn't mean you let him off. It actually means that you see higher potential. So you're going to raise the fucking bar for both of you. You're doing this for you and Oakley and you're doing it for him. And he'll make his choice as to whether or not he can raise the bar too. And he very well might not. And that's okay. Right. I'll be okay. You're going to be more than okay, honey. You're going to be <laughs> fucking fantastic. Because you're Oakley's mom. And you will fight for that kid. And in fighting for him and setting the example, you will also be fighting for yourself. What are you thinking? I just feel good. I'm so grateful. I do. I feel like I said, I feel so good. I feel like I could take, you know, over the world right after this. <laughs> well, you know, look, the fear is going to be there. And you're going to have the conversation anyway. And the feelings are going to be there, Brooke. And you're going to feel overwhelmed and you're going to talk through them. And I would highly recommend that you put down some bullets on a piece of paper. What are the important bullets to you? Therapy. Therapy, right? And why are you having this conversation? That of being a bullet. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Why? What's your why? Why are you having this conversation? This is a really important bullet. Are you asking me? I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> because it's a, you know, the way it's impacting Oakley and and, my, and myself and yeah. him, him yeah. too, as a person, but Oakley foremost. And yeah, you know, because he, you don't have to be here if you don't want to be. I mean, if you want to find your process somewhere else, you have an option to do that, you know. And this, it's time to get this process started. You know what I mean? He needs to start yeah. this healing process, and I will respect that. And I understand that I, and I'll support it, but I want to see it actually starting and actually being a real thing. Not, you know, sorry, I didn't do well with the bullet part thing, but. <laughs> Brooke, stop making yourself wrong. You did amazing. Cause here's the thing. The second that you're willing to let him walk out the door, you have opened up the door to a whole new you. Stop trying to keep, like, you need to stop trying to keep him. You got to be willing to let someone leave. You do. Because the second that you're willing to let him walk out that door, he is now free to choose whether or not he's going to stay and show up. And so you are, you said it beautifully. 
there are three reasons why you're having this conversation. Number one, you're Oakley's mom. Do you want to write that down? Yes. Okay, write it down. Number one, I'm Oakley's mom. And this toxic dynamic between us, I'm not going to have it around him anymore. He deserves a man in his life who is working to get better. The second why, Brooke, is you can say to him, I love you. And I'm not going to stand by and watch you spiral. And I love what you said. Your healing journey starts today. And you're either going to do it with my support, which means you're going to go to therapy once a week for three months, and you're going to share with me what's going on so I can be supportive of it. Or you're going to start your healing process elsewhere with somebody else. And the third reason why I'm having this is I got to do this for me. I deserve someone who is growing with me and who can accept my support and who is taking responsibility for their own stuff. And the only way I'm going to know that these three things are handled is if I see you going to therapy once a week with a professional to get the support you deserve. That's it. That was great. You're great. And here's the other thing I want you to understand, Brooke. Expect to feel uncomfortable. Expect yeah. to cry. Like, don't walk like you're feeling excited now. I promise you the second he walks back in, he's like, what? You're going to be like, ah! Expect it because then you won't be as freaked out when the emotions flood. Okay? You think I should do this right now? Fuck yes. Okay. Oh, good. Oh, boy. Because otherwise, five, four, three, two, one. Five, four, three, two, one. Right. You're speaking from your heart right now. Yeah. And you can say, I, like, if he doesn't immediately be like, I'm in. That's kind of your answer. If he's like, I got to think about it, be like, great, we're going to have breakfast tomorrow morning and you're going to tell me whether you're going to start your healing somewhere else with somebody else or if you're going to accept this gift I'm giving you and this request I'm making. That's it. That's it. Like, I got to raise this. I've got to raise the game here. We're going to play a bigger game. Do you have any questions, any other questions or concerns or anything else that's rattling around other than shit? Should I have the conversation now? No, I don't think so. Other than, I mean, if you want to, you know, I'll pay you. We can, you know, meet weekly and we can, you know, <laughs> be my. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, my. I, well, I will meet weekly. I'm here every Monday and every Thursday for you. And, and it always feels so good. Well, what's happening is see, I think everybody on the planet wants one thing. You want to live a life where you feel like your best and your truest self is what is the, per you know, like every one of us, including Adam and Oakley and you and me, we all just want to live our lives feeling like we can express our best, truest selves. That's it. That's it. So does Adam, by the way. But we don't want to give up the stuff that feels good that we're doing that are, you know, self-destructive. That's the bitch. Yeah, that's the bitch. But, but here's the thing. You're also doing this because you know it doesn't feel good for Adam to live like this. True, right. You're not trying to fix him. You are holding up a light and saying there is a bigger possibility here and your actions have demonstrated that you're not going to do that on your own so here is the path 
therapy three months, once a week, or you're going to start your healing somewhere else. That's it. Okay? You're going to do great. Remember, Molly and I and everybody listening are your guardian angels holding up the light. You can do this. I promise you, you can do this, and I want to know how it goes, okay? Thank you so much. I love you. I'm really proud of you, and Oakley's a really lucky little guy to have such an awesome mom. Thank you, Mel. You're welcome, darling. Mwah. I hope that our conversation today has been a wake-up call for you, too. Um, that you've got the tools now to spot those moments where you're being used or where you're just in a situation where the people around you are used to things the old way and you now are tapping into something greater for yourself. And what's exciting about seeing a bigger vision for your own life is that it does elevate what you see in terms of the potential in people that you love. And that's a really good thing. But remember... When you're the one that wants to change the situation, it's your responsibility to lay out the plan that is specific that gets you there. And I think one of the biggest things that I want both you and I to remember is that people aren't in our lives so that we can grip onto them. And we're also not meant to be everybody's caretakers. And just because the situation works for somebody else doesn't mean you got to continue to tolerate it. You can demand higher standards for yourself. You can demand them on behalf of your kids or on behalf of your business, but I hope you will also demand those higher standards on behalf of yourself because you deserve that. And also, don't forget, this is not about ultimatums. This is about presenting empowered choices to people. It's about saying, this is where I'm headed. This is how I need you to show up. And you can choose to start that healing and that level up process with me today by playing this game, or you can choose to start that healing or that level up or down process with someone else. That is giving someone a choice. Silently resenting them, silently wondering whether or not you're being used, getting in these toxic fights, that's not healthy. What's healthy is clear communication about what you need, about what you deserve, and about what choice somebody has. And then you got to be willing to let somebody walk out the door. You got to be willing to let them say, I'm not ready to heal. I'm not ready to do that. I don't want to do that. Fuck you. That's okay. Because when you let somebody walk out the door, you actually open up a whole new possibility for you. Because these conversations are not really about changing somebody else. It's about changing you. It's about you practicing the highest and the most courageous self-expression. It's about you requesting what you need in your life. And when you do that from a place of love for yourself, for those around you, and even for the person that you're laying this choice out for, trust me, everything works out exactly how it's meant to. Because you are raising the game for yourself. And I love that when you do that. And a final note on being used. You're only being used if you allow it. I mean, come on now. I didn't really say this to uh, Crystal or Brooke, but you're allowing shit if you continue to sit in the situation. You got two feet. You can walk out the door. You will be just fine on your own. But if you're staying in something that doesn't work and you know it, you're not being used because you're participating in it. You're used to feeling like shit. You're used to being in a situation that's toxic. You're used to somebody who's not available. You're used to bullshit excuses and actually accepting them. So don't point the finger at them. If you've been in the situation for a long ass time, you're used to it. And it's time to level up your own ass. And maybe that means you're the one that's supposed to walk out the door. Boom. That's the door shutting behind you. That sound good? All right. In case nobody else tells you, I believe in you. I do. I know you can do this. You can raise the game. And I love you. I love you for um, so many things. And uh, 
go do it, okay? Go put your family on a performance improvement plan and uh, put yourself first, okay? I'll talk to you in a few days. You're awesome. Oh, one more thing. It's the legal language. This podcast is presented solely for educational and entertainment purposes. It is not intended as a substitute for the advice of a physician, professional coach, psychotherapist, or other qualified professional. Hey, it's Mel. Thank you so much for being here. If you enjoyed that video, by God, please subscribe because I don't want you to miss a thing. Thank you so much for being here. We've got so much amazing stuff coming. Thank you so much for sending this stuff to your friends and your family. I love you. We create these videos for you. So make sure you subscribe. Mwah.